The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. When someone has a near-death experience, what should they do with what they learned? Should they hide that light under a bushel, tell a few friends and relatives, or share it with the world? Our guest today decided not only to share his experience, but to find a way to share other some other people's NDEs as well. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Timothy O'Reilly, grew up in Queens, New York City, and had a near-death-like experience when he was 10 years old. Although he didn't give much thought to his experience when it happened, Tim believes a seed was planted which inspired him to produce and direct the documentary Round Trip, The Near-Death Experience, some 30 years later. Along with Round Trip's general audience appeal, the documentary is being utilized by hospices throughout the country and the world for its healing quality. Tim's film was endorsed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who said, I love Round Trip and all its characters. Tim, welcome to NDE Radio. Welcome, Lee. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. You're surviving the snow in New Jersey? Yes, I am. Yeah, <laughs> After a day long of shoveling, yeah. I'll bet. Um, hey, Tim, let's begin by telling folks about your own near-death experience. Sure. I was uh, 10 years old, and it was back in 1962, and I was walking home with, uh, with a bunch of friends, and we came upon this empty lot. It was a huge um, empty lot. Actually, it was like a giant pit. Because there was a there was a swamp at the bottom of it, so it was like a you know 45 degree angle going down, and my friends and I we started throwing rocks into the swamp, and then I decided to go down th- down to the bottom of it and walk across. There was old, old tires that had wooden planks connecting one tire to the other. So I started to walk across the swamp. And about halfway across, another group of kids showed up on the other side, on the other rim, and we started. They started to have a rock fight, and I I got caught in the middle of it. So I said, I better get out of here. So I started to run back to my side, and when I was about six feet away from dry land, I looked up, and one of my friends at the top of the rim, who's about thirty feet high, he had this huge rock in his in his hand. He was holding it with both hands above his head, and he about to you know, he just let it go towards me. He said he intended to splash me. I looked mm. up. I saw this thing coming right towards my head, and I said, oh, my God, it's going to hit me. And I turned, and it hit me square in the back of my head and mm. knocked me right out. I went right into the water, but I felt like I was still standing. I didn't miss a beat. That was the strange thing. The... the my mind that I still had when I was looking up at the rock coming towards me, I still had the same mind. I, and I was in this black void, this voice of darkness, but I could feel that I still had a body. My, I, I, I felt it was transparent. I could feel my fingers, my arms were outstretched. And uh, the only... Uh, then the next thing I remember hearing, I heard this buzzing sound. And the only thing I thought of, I was 10 years old, and the only thing I thought of was this movie that I used to watch. I was watching on a million-dollar movie on Channel 11 in New York. It was called Rodan, Japanese movie, where it had this big dinosaur bird that mm-hmm. would send out this electric charge on his beak, beak and blow up the cities. And that reminded me of the charge when it, when it, when he sent it out to blow up the city. That was the only thing I thought of, but I had no feeling of, I wasn't afraid. I didn't have a feeling of uh, unconditional love or anything like that. I didn't see any light, white light or speck of one. And the next thing I know, um, I felt like my, right below my knees started to melt, it seemed like. And I was started to sway back and forth, and I, I assume my my spirit uh, that I experienced went back into my body. I didn't feel it called back in. Next thing I know, the water was only the, the tires were vast. The, the water was probably only four 
six inches. Uh, I, I got out. My friends helped me, and they walked me back to uh, my apartment and housing project at the time. And my grandfather was home, and he took me to the hospital and got some stitches. And then next thing I know, I'm back on the couch watching a million-dollar movie again. <laughs> I I remember it well. It turns out I grew up in the same town, Cranford, that Tim lives in today. Um, yeah. So, so Tim, um, did you tell your grandfather what you saw, what you experienced? No, no, no. I don't even, I don't even know if I told my friend. Uh, I, mm. I might have told my friend, but I don't remember really. I don't remember telling no. anyone. Uh, uh-huh. And I didn't, I didn't give it any thought. I, I read Raymond, Raymond Moody's book in the mid '80s, Life After Light, the first book that came out. And I was just fascinated by the idea that and these people took a peek at heaven. And they were able to come back, but I still didn't connect my own experience with the near-death experience until I was, you know, creating Round Trip, uh, which was my thesis project at the School of Visual Arts. And I, I read several books on near-death experience, and the dark void and also the buzzing sound uh, was, it was is one of the uh, earliest signs. It is a is a um, sign of a near-death experience some people experience that so i've heard i've heard that from other people that that buzzing sound um yeah so you had been thinking about it obviously when you were trying to come up with a thesis for the school of visual arts um how did you make contact with the people that uh, you interviewed well i put an ad in the ian's newsletter and i got one response and then he gave me Telephone numbers for the other people because they're all in, they were all in the tri-state area. Well, yeah, New York area, Queens, Manhattan, uh, Westchester. Um, and the two, two researchers, uh, Steve Rosen and, uh, um, Grasso, Michael Grasso, they were contributors to the IN's journal. Mm. Yeah. And I got them, I, I guess I got them through I ends as well. And, well, this, uh, they're both, yeah. I was just going to say, this is exactly how Ian's wants to contribute to, uh, the, uh, the spread of the ideas, uh, and the, and the realities of NDEs. I, I also liked, um, uh, Dick Sparks, the priest who, uh, I guess he was billed as a moral theologian, but he was, uh, for a priest, I thought quite supportive of the notion of, of, um, NDEs. Yeah, he was. He, he was very open to it, and he was supportive of, supportive of it. That which was great. I just want. I, I'm a Catholic, and I'm not practicing Catholic, but I was raised a Catholic, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to. All my life, I heard, you know, you, you die, you go to heaven. So this was sounded like it was pretty close to heaven. People had mm-hmm. near death experience, so I wanted to have a religious, you know, view of it. Um, opinion on it, yeah. And he, he he was great. He, he was really good. He supported yeah. it. Yeah. I noticed that he said that uh, love and warmth for him, at least, equaled grace, which is a a connection of the physical world with the uh, with the spiritual world. I, I like that little connection that he made there. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, and Steve Rosen too is very interesting. He said that uh, uh, NDEs violate common sense, but um, in reality, uh, what what he's seen in people is that it overcomes the separateness of life and death. That we, and probably that's why people who've gone through this don't fear death any longer because they they they, they see the connection, they see the continuity of it. I thought he was yes. uh, quite profound. In fact, I think all of your choices in your in your um, documentary were excellent because it was such a nice juxtaposition of different points of view. But the commonality of the experiences were was striking, and uh, and then at one point you get everybody together in the same room, and uh, they're having a conversation together. Um, I I don't know if you've ever been to an IONS conference, but we have experiencer rooms at the IONS meetings where people oh. who've had experiences get together, and it's oh. uh it's a powerful it's a powerful event. You know we. I remember one year we had to pray for someone who'd been injured. We all joined hands and said a prayer for the wow. for the person's recovery. 
and the electricity in that circle was astounding. Wow, you so, feel the energy, yeah. Yeah, our next one isn't going to be in Orlando. I don't know if you'll get a chance to get down there, but um, I, I think you'd enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, tell me a, a little about um, <clears throat> how you approach the the uh, the people that you interviewed. Did you uh, what, what, did you have to talk them into it, or were they w- just willing to go along with the with the idea? No, they they were willing to go along with it. They were very, um, yeah, they they were um, they were they were great about it. I uh, and I those were the only people that responded to the ad. One person did from he was from Illinois, but I was too far away. Mm-hmm. He wanted to um, do the project, but yeah, I you know. Um, I didn't have to choose from anybody. They would, they were just there. They were very willing. And what I did was I, I met them and I went over the, I had about 10 questions, I think 10 mm-hmm. to 10 to 12 questions. And I just met with them before I showed up with the camera and talked to them. And yeah, they, they were very willing and very eager to do it. And, uh, and when we got together, so when I did show up with the camera and they, they knew what was coming, and they, they seemed very relaxed and comfortable with it. And well, w- one of the great things about the way you did this was, you know, when, when they do um, the stories of NDEs on public, uh, well, I don't want to say public broadcasting because that's not what I mean, but, but commercial broadcasting, right. uh, they often use these, you know, these special effects, this sort of woo-woo stuff to try and simulate or... Um, project what kind of visual thing happened to the person. Yours is just very straightforward. It's it's very conversational and you give the people a, the space to um, to talk through what what happened to them. So it seems very natural. Uh the Elena Ort um, uh, the woman yeah. from Ort. had yeah, the uh, yeah. had the accident in the Sinai. Um right. I right. Loved, uh, she yeah. said her her first reaction was she felt like laughing. She just and not because it was funny, but because it was so such a, a happy, moving experience when she was uh, finally out of her body. And I guess she saw an, sort of an orange and a white color light. But um, but right. just um, but at the same time, she felt uh, responsible enough that she was she wanted to come back, unlike some of the others who would have been glad to stay there and and got told that it wasn't their time yet. Yes, she she actually saw her um, her kids float by in the cloud, and her ex husband too. That, that was interesting, and she just felt they needed her for her to go back. And the laughing part was, I think she was just happy. You know, she just was like so happy to be there, and she she was in a wheelchair. I didn't show it on the on the documentary. She's in a wheelchair from the accident. From the accident, wow. Yeah, yeah, but I I don't know whether. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think she wanted me to, uh, f- uh, you know, film her in the, you know, show the wheelchair. Right, but then on the other hand, Catherine Peretti was healed from her near-death experience. Oh yeah, she yeah she has a fantastic story now. Now she yeah, she's a she's a reverend, but she, oh yeah, she was very sickly. I mean, she was down to seventy-five pounds, and she's only about five foot three. Um, mm. Yeah, and the, the thing about her was. I, uh, by the way, she would be great to have on your show as a guest. She, I, I was she thinking was, that, yes. Oh, she's fantastic. She she was always psychic since she was a child. But then when when, when she had her NDE, she, one of the parts of it was she was walking down the road and she passed people who were in bed and they, they rose up. So it was a symbol to her, a sign for her. Like she walked past them and they were healed. So when she returned mm. back from her NDE, she said her psychic ability was just bursting. And before that, she had she was psychic, but she didn't know what to do with it. You know, she didn't have like a focus to, to where to go with it or how to really use it. But after her NDE, she knew what she had to do with it. I mean, that's what she does today. She, you know, she heals people, um, you know, counsels people uh, through her psychic ability um, emotionally. And she has also actually healed people physically too as well, you know. So she was, said yeah, she was, saw, she felt like she was floating, and she saw angels. I think as part of her experience. Yes, yes, 
yeah, she says the, the room was filled with angels and yeah, Angelia, Angelica music, Angelica the mu- music was playing. Yeah, mm. yeah, she actually, I mean, she really, uh, she actually stood up. You know, the doctors, I think there was a priest giving her the last rites, I believe. Yeah, she was she was very <laughs> close to death, and uh, and, and it was funny. Dr. Both Smith. the doctor, I guess, and the priest said, "No, this is impossible," <laughs> and just walked right, away right. from her. They couldn't. That's they, right. They, they could not explain <laughs> what what had happened there. Yeah, that was, that was something. Now, Mary Pollock mm. mentioned, she, now she had an emergency cesarean and an out-of-body right. experience. And she, she described um, hearing a password to knowledge that the angels told her she had to learn for herself. Um, and, and she said once she knew that password, she had access to all of the... Answers to all of the questions she ever had, I guess. Right, total knowledge. That's right, total knowledge. And she, she did not. She was one. Yeah, she did not want to come back. Um, but then she felt like she was going through a tunnel, just like sent back, like rocketed back. Yeah, she and, said it was uh, horrifying coming back. Right, right, oh, that's right. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> but but, I, but she also said she's had insights about the future as well after after having that experience. Yeah, she's she's become yes yeah, psychic. She was she told me yes yeah, she became um, psychic from that experience. But I don't know if that stayed with her because I did I have heard people who come back with even John MacLeagio he he said that he had all this knowledge, but I don't know if they retain it all when they come back do they lose it gradually over time or uh actually some i don't know for some people it strengthens some people okay. you know i think it's something like uh you know uh, use it or lose it and if you practice it it will grow it, it be, becomes a more mature talent a gift that you got from your nde but I, um uh, if you don't use it, I think probably you, you lose the the sense, or even the faith that you can you can have a premonition like that. Right, I see. Uh, yes, unlike with Catherine, uh, Reverend Catherine Peretti, she, you know, Shahara's psychic ability just was enhanced, and and I, you know, just so uh, it stayed with her, obviously, you know. Mm-hmm. But now, one, one thing, um, John, yeah. John's. Uh, Experience was, came from drowning, right? Yes, he was scuba diving by himself, which they tell you never to do. Mm. And he ran out of air, and he was swimming back. You know, he realized he had, he had to just get back. So, I, I believe it was down the Jersey Shore. So he started to swim back, and then I guess from exhaustion or whatever it was, he felt like he, he was looking at himself like from four feet over his shoulder, and then. Mm. Next thing you know, he's like hundreds of feet up in the sky looking down at himself. He said, felt like he had one brain but two sets of eyes. Hmm. And then the next thing you know, he's, he's on the beach and he felt like he was in the middle of a football huddle. I guess somebody must have gave him CPR. Because what happened, I guess he went he was swimming in, he just like passed out and, you know, and drowned. And hmm. uh, he got, but he got washed up on shore, maybe someone went out to get him. And, um, yeah, he just he just woke up and I felt like he was in a football huddle. And but he but he says a very interesting thing. He said that somebody said, I guess in the crowd, that he or he just he just heard while he was having this experience. Somebody said that he panicked, and he said that wasn't true. So he said he he yelled, you know, he thought he was yelling it. No, I didn't panic. And he mm-hmm. says when he did that, because it, it was during this time he was traveling to it. He saw this white light. He was in this black boy, but he saw this white light. He's traveling to it. But when he said, I didn't panic because it wasn't true, he said he came right back. And that's when he woke up in the, in the huddle. So I thought, thought that that was very interesting. He was, um, you know, acknowledging something that was true. And bang, he, he you know. He, right. As long I, as he made that connection and wanted to correct that error. He was still tied to his body. Uh, I, I had yeah, another guest, yeah. another guest that uh, told a similar story where um, I think it was this woman's mother kept pleading with her to come back, to come back, 
and it irritated her so much. <laughs> she didn't want to come back, but she oh, yeah. <laughs> she said she came back just to tell her mother to shut up. <laughs> and, and, and when That's she did, funny. she found she was stuck in her body again. Oh, boy. Um, one of the th- interesting things about John's story was that he was not necessarily a religious person or even necessarily believed in God, but after this mm-hmm. experience, he said there's certainly a power. And then he, on, on the, uh, in the interview, he says there is a God. Yeah. And that every, yes, do, yeah. everything is in balance was something else that he said. Yeah. Yeah. It was all, it was everything, that's right. It was, it was, uh, just totally dynamic and everything was, uh, uh, yeah, in balance. And, uh, one thing is I it? did, did, um, uh, learn from these people, you know, I spent time with them because I went there before I interviewed them and then I interviewed them and then I got to when I got them in the group and how that was Elena's apartment. Uh, I had this feeling, I got this feeling from them that no matter what happens in their life, the house burns down, they lose a loved one, of course they're going to be upset and, and feel the emotional pain. Or whatever happens in the world, everything's going to be, it's going to be okay. That was the feeling I got from these people. Because I never really talked to anybody who had a near-death experience before that. And that was, that was, um, kind of, um, it was, it was good to hear, <laughs> you know? Well, I think this is one of the things that, uh, uh, IONS and other groups like IONS and individuals who've had near-death experiences. Now, now they're estimating some 774 people a day in this country have, have an NDE. So if everyone wow. would tell everyone else about their experience, um, it would, uh, it, it could change the world. I mean, it would change our perception of what life and death is all about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, like Steve, I, Steve Rosen said, as you mentioned earlier, overcoming the separation between life and death, he said, is a wonderful and joyous, joyous experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing, um, Michael, uh, was it Grosso? Right. One of the other PhDs that you interviewed, um, his, uh, his point was that NDEers place a very high value on, uh, Life enhancing unconditional love. Right. And certainly that, that is what the world needs a whole lot more of these days. We need oh, to, yeah. uh, stop being at each other's throats all the time and, and start, um, being part of the, join the group as it were, you know, because we're all in the same boat together. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, and, I think that's. And yet, uh, and you know that's uh, uh my Tim that's one of the great things about your um your uh, DVD is that it um uh, it tells that story very clearly. I really I really hope people will um uh, get a copy for themselves and watch it because what you what you did with that DVD is very much like what I'm trying to do with this with this radio show is uh-huh. uh draw people out, have them tell their experiences and um and then how it changed their lives. Now, have you yeah. thought about doing a follow-up with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, the, no, with the subject? No, yeah. you know, once I, I, I finished it, when, when I did finish it, I had, uh, uh, someone approach me to do, this woman approached me to do a documentary on euthanasia. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and, but it was like pro euthanasia, so I didn't feel comfortable with it, and I had a, uh, I was supposed to work with somebody else, and I really didn't want to work with anybody. You know, I just wanted to be in charge of it. Uh, but no, I never, I never uh, uh, did a, you know, thought about doing a follow up or, or anything like that. But I have been writing screenplays for the last uh, fifteen years. I haven't sold any yet. But one of my, I, I was a uh, after, it'll be well, just way before film school. I was a New York City cop for about two years when I was twenty-one years old. Mm-hmm. And I was laid off, and then I was a cop for about, about a year and a half. I was laid off. The city had a fiscal crisis. That was back in 1975. Then I went back in 1978, and this was when I, I worked as a cop in Queens. And then I didn't want to do it anymore, and I, I just I resigned after about six months. You know, my father and my brothers thought I was crazy because I come from an Irish Catholic family. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the 
one of my screenplays is about uh, a corrupt cop who has a near-death experience. Uh-huh. And it, it changes him from, you know, he was violent. I mean, he's stealing, just stealing money. He, and he had, he's married as a mistress. So, but when he has his near death experience, he comes back. He cannot tolerate negativity anymore. But he's with his world was all negative. Was a world of negativity. So it's not so easy. That's when the, the, the so it's not so easy for him to walk away. So that project, that's what I've been um, focusing on, and hopefully, God willing, it will be produced. And that movie will. It's going to be entertaining as a regular cop story. But mm-hmm. the the, the, slub, the subplot to it is going to be spiritual, and it will be great because it will be able to um, introduce many people to the NDE. I think that's terrific. When you yeah, uh, so that's my when you, sequel in the same subject matter. Yeah. yeah, when you finally get that together, we'll have to do another show. Uh, and oh, you can, definitely. You can t- tell us more about that. Um, sure. Yeah, do you so feel? A, do you feel that? Uh, hmm. It's taken a long time for your experience at ten years old to to materialize. It took thirty years to do the yeah, yes, the, that's definitely the DVD, and now it's another what ten, ten or more years, fifteen yeah. years, yeah. and uh, yeah. and it's uh, coming out again in your screenplay. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of people have this kind of long-term, life-changing, but very slowly changing um, effect. You know, f- they notice f- from the NDE they experienced. Uh, you know, mine was when I was seven years old and I drowned. It took me years to to really get into it the way it took you. Um, w- w- uh, w- I had a question. I all, yeah, I think it's all about timing. Because, you know, well, first of all, when I had my experience back in 1962, and, and I'm sure that everybody else had their experiences in the 50s and 60s, no, nobody's told anybody about it. I mean, it wasn't publicized or anything, you know. But I, I think that people who I interviewed, even in the documentary, I think John himself said he didn't, want, he didn't talk about it for seven years, you know, because mm-hmm. there's a fear of being thought crazy. But now... It, you know, in the last 30 years, I guess, or 20 years, it's becoming, you know, more, um, um, a lot more popular and people are more open to it and accepting to it. So getting back to my point, I think it's all about timing. You know, I went to, uh, you know, um, I, I kind of stumbled upon this. I, I was, I studied art, painting and drawing after I quit the cops. I, I had several different jobs and I studied, uh, at the Art Students League, and then I went to the, uh, then I, w- I went to the School of Visual Arts to get my undergraduate degree, so I can go to graduate school, so I could teach painting at a college level. But when I my, after my first semester at the School of Visual Arts as a fine arts major, I realized I didn't want to teach painting at the college level, so I switched my major to film, my second love, and that's how round trip started. So it was kind of like just stumbled into it. Do you know what I mean? Because I think. It was always intended. Well, I think I was always intended to do that. This was my life, but I didn't mm-hmm. realize it until, you know. Just, and then when I was doing my, this is as far as my thesis film, most students do a thesis film. Uh, you know, then I, that's what I was going to do. I was going to do a, a thesis film, a 10, 15 minute film on, actually, it was going to be a short story, one of Heming- Hemingway short stories, The Killers, it's called. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I was writing the script. I was writing the script, but I wasn't into it, you know, I wasn't into it 100%. And when you do a student film, you know, a short film, it's a lot of work. It's, and oh, I of course. Well, this was, I, this was not 10 or 15 minutes. Yours is like 40 no, minutes oh, long. Yeah, 40 minutes. But I, I just wasn't into it 100%. I, like I, I, I was working on the script. I didn't cast anybody for it, but and then I just didn't feel right. So I thought about doing a documentary because I thought about the near death experience when I read, you know, I said, what, what else can I do? What, what, what yeah. else can I do? And then I thought about hey, Raymond Moody's hey, book. And that was it. I went to, I went to bed that night. Next morning I woke up. I said, I'm doing a documentary on, on the near death experience. And I was in everything kind of like basically fell, 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 fell into mind. place. Tim, we're just about yeah. out of time here. Oh, How can people bad. get a, a copy of your, uh, uh, film oh, Round Trip: The Near Death Experience. You go to Amazon.com, 
Okay. And and I there is a VHS version of it, but that was when the distributor had it. I took over in 2008, so I transferred it to DVD. Mm-hmm. But at, on YouTube, they can just put in, um, type in round trips and near death experience, and I have a trailer on YouTube. And I also have a website that's uh, www.roundtriptoneardeathexperience. And on there, there's also a trailer. Of Great. Tim, I, I want to thank you uh, for your story uh, and how your NDE led to the making of the documentary Round Trip. If uh, listeners would like to uh, hear this show again or uh, listen to any of our past shows, just go to our re- website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANDS, check out their website, iands.org. And tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.